Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you for being here. Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 531st New Social Environment. I'm Eleanor, the program's assistant here at the rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring artist Walton Ford and rail editor at large, Jason Rosenfeld. And we'd like to thank Gagosian for supporting today's conversation. Um, super grateful for their support. And you can explore Walton Ford's work and current exhibition through Gagosian's website. We will post the link in the chat and visit the current exhibition through April 23rd. And we're also thrilled to welcome poet Leanne Brown here to close today's program. Now, before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you all to check the chat for a working document of resources and actions in a moment. And over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and all of our operations here at The Rail. So please check the chat for information and links to donate. And now to introduce today's guest and host, appropriate techniques from natural history. Walton Ford's expansive watercolor paintings allude to colonialism, extinction, and the ecological consequences of the Anthropocene epoch, tempered with wit and satire. Ford is the recipient of several national awards and honors, including a fellowship from the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. His work has been featured at Bowdoin College, Museum of Art, and the Southeastern Center of Contemporary Art, along with many other institutions. And our host, Jason Rosenfeld, is the Distinguished Chair and Professor of Art History at Marymount Manhattan College and has curated exhibitions at Tate Britain, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and many other institutions. He is a co-author of the monograph Cecily Brown and is a senior writer and editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. Thank you both so much for being here. I'm so excited to have all of our guests here. And I would love to pass the mic over to you now, Jason. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Welcome everyone. Um, we're really excited to have Walton with us today. Uh, a few thank yous on my end. Thanks to Nick who arranges everything and makes the world spin. Um, thanks to team Gagosian, especially uh, uh, Putri Tan, Tan who works with Walton. Um, Thanks to our poet, Leanne Brown, who you'll hear from later, and also Robert in, um, in the studio, in Walton's studio, who is essential to making anything work. And uh, I'm coming to you live from the West Village. Walton's coming to you live from downtown, slightly downtown from me. And we welcome you to new social environment number 531. Remarkably, since March of 2020, we've been going strong. If new social environments were like home runs in Major League Baseball, of course, opening day is in two days. We would be between Willie McCovey, Ted Williams, and Frank Thomas at 521, and approaching Jimmy Fox at 534, and Mickey Mantle in 536. We will pass Mickey Mantle next week. A little baseball stuff for you, because you now don't need to worry about college basketball anymore. So uh, welcome, and welcome to Walton. Walton and I have a, a relationship that goes back to November of 2017, when I interviewed him for the Brooklyn Rail, which I encourage you to check out. Maybe we can stick that uh, link in the chat. And then uh, in November of 2018, I did a conversation with him hosted by Casman Gallery and the Rail on his show, uh, Barbary, which was on view then. And this is his first show in New York um, since then. Welcome, Walton, how are you? I'm doing good, thanks. I'm in my studio and um, so that's fun. <laughs> that's fun, you're a happy place, right? Yeah. 
and you've survived wherever we are in COVID. I haven't seen you since the yeah yeah everything I was I was here in New York. Um, I'm I'm lucky. I was able to just keep working, and yeah. Um, so yeah, blessings on that. That was good. Um, You've been busy. You've been busy making a lot. Yeah, of I, I I did this show kind of you know a lot of artists that found it a productive period if they were able to stay healthy. You know. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I'm here a little bit of a plug here for the show um, on the screen. You can see it's up at Gagosian's flagship location. Can we say that? I guess so. <laughs> at five 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 West Twenty Fourth Street. Yeah. Um, down in Chelsea. It's up through April 23rd um, and it's terrific. I'll show you a couple uh, installation views here. Um, top right pictures we will be talking about. The one in the bottom right here, just to give you a sense of those of you not so familiar with uh, Walton's work, the scale of these paintings, which is magnificent. They're monumental. These large scale watercolors like you see here. Um, here's the larger gallery view. Uh, there are numerous large-scale watercolors and uh, all different subjects, which we will talk about. Walton is a master storyteller, both on paper and in person, as you will hear. Um, and there are also, uh, surprisingly to me, but thrillingly, there's a room in the back of the gallery with uh, sketches, watercolor sketches, drawings, which are quite wonderful. So I'll show you, some, we'll show you some examples of those uh, as we go through and talk about, I guess, your process in making uh, these works. So the title of the exhibition is Cabeza de Vaca. Well, and actually, no, not of the exhibition, no. Oh, not of the show, just of this. Oh, just, just of this work. Painting. I just, just of this I, painting. yeah, I just, it's just Walton Ford. Just Walton Ford, just going <laughs> by the name. Sorry to <laughs> correct you, but it's- No, just, no, you're right, you're right. It's I all didn't... about the brand. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, didn't. Just, I don't know. I just didn't title this show. That's all. Partly that's because yeah, you know it's not as tightly focused as some of the other exhibits you've done, like um, the Barbary show, which was about lions, which we'll allude to uh, in a bit. So um, this is, however, the kind of uh, centerpiece of the show. You walk in and you see this, and you don't understand what you're looking at till you come uh, closer to it, and then you notice that. There's a big old snake, which you can see from the street, basically, if the doors are open. And then there's a guy here on the left, and then there's some mountains, and then you start to think about scale and how big this snake is. So maybe talk to people a little bit, just to kind of introduce them to your process and how you arrive at uh, work like this. Sure. Well, Cabeza de Baca was a uh, Spanish conquistador, and he was shipwrecked in Florida in the 1530s. And he basically, there was, he was one of 300 uh, men that were shipwrecked um, in Florida at this time. And at the time of uh, very little uh, European in, uh, uh, contact in a big chunks of North and, and, and South America. So he, he basically walked from Florida to Mexico City. Um, it took him eight years, he was lost. Um, he was one of only, I believe, three, three or four survivors out of uh, 300 men. Um, and he survived. Uh, he was at first enslaved by various uh, uh, indigenous tribes and then passed from tribe to tribe, but uh, eventually um, set himself up as a sort of healer and a, a, a sort of... Uh, he was a revered um, medicine man, for lack of a better word, um, and was traded as well uh, and, and, and helped along by the native peoples. Who, who, he, he ended up with a, a sort of respect and, and a, a kind of a, a mutually beneficial relationship that allowed him to survive um, with the native peoples. When he finally arrived in, in Spanish held territory closer to Mexico City, um, he started noticing burned out villages and terrified natives and, and the real violence of war. And then he saw men on horseback, his own countrymen approaching and um, they enslaved the natives that he was with and, um, and took Cabeza de Vaca back to Lisbon with them. And he wrote all of this down 
So my, I've been thinking about his story for a hell of a long time. And um, I read it maybe 10 years ago. I read his, his chronicle, as you've just put up, pulled up on the screen. But I didn't know what to do with it as far as I'm going to make a painting about this. What do I have to add to this story? And what I realized I had was, was <laughs> I started thinking about rattlesnakes everywhere that Cabeza de Baca walked, there would have been rattlesnakes. But Florida has Eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, which are big hog, hog of a snake and um, really terrifying animal. Um, out West, you get Western diamondback rattlesnakes, but in between there's all these different types. There's pygmy ones and I don't know, just every, they've got tons of name, black tail, this, that, the other. Every, every place you went, there would have been different types of rattlesnakes. And not only that, um, there were no rattlesnakes. There are no rattlesnakes in Europe. It's a completely new world species. So this is unique. This would have been a unique creature. He wouldn't have ever had any imagined. You can't imagine a thing like that. A, a poisonous snake with a rattle on its tail sounds like something somebody made up. So I wanted to basically create a sort of post-traumatic nightmare for Cabeza de Baca when he's back in Spain. You know, the thing that in a cliche, in a movie, they have people waking up like this, you know, <laughs> and it's like, that's not how we actually have nightmares, but, but um, this idea of just what he went through and, and the misapprehension of a place you don't understand, terror of the unknown, you know, all of those things kind of coming out in this image. I pictured a bad dream where he comes over the bluff and sees a 30 mile long rattlesnake. These are now Jason's pulled up studies. So this is more about my process. I need to, I like to get it right. I like to study the animals. Um, so I want to, I, I, give me a second and I'm going to break down a, a sort of important distinction that I make. I have two POVs that I do in my work. My work is basically about wild animals, but only wild animals in relationship to uh, human contact. So wild animals as they live in the human imagination or wild animals that have been besieged by humans in some way or another. Um, the relationship between uh, human beings and domestic animals is a sort of partnership. There's an agreement there. Dogs chose us as much as we chose them. Same with cats, same with every domestic animal, believe it or not, even cows and cattle. They, they, they benefit as a species from our relationship with them, either in a population way, like they've spread all over the globe, like cattle have. Um, so, but wild animals have made no pact with human beings and would just as soon get the fuck away from us. And so this idea of having um, it being a one-sided sort of obsessional relationship coming from us where we're interested in lions because they symbolize nobility to us, or they prove that we're brave if we hunt them, or they are in front of the library. A, a lion doesn't care about any of that. A lion wants to be left alone, you know, um, by human beings. And they evolved before we, when we were little monkeys anyway. So the whole thing is not of interest to them particularly. Anyhow, so if I have two points of view, and I, I'm just, I know this is a long-winded answer, but I think it's important. It'll set us up for the rest of the conversation. One point of view is how, the, how animals live in, how wild animals live in our imagination. And the other is to really take the point of view of the animal itself. And usually the pains are sort of a combination of both. So this one is such a human story. This is the rattlesnake as it lives in Cabeza de Baca's mind. This is a rattlesnake, not as it lives in nature, but as it lives in our fear, our irrational fear of venomous snakes, which we just have as an evolutionary thing, I guess. Many people have it worse than others. That said, I still want to respect the animal, even if I'm painting it from this kind of bizarre con construct. So I'll like study the scales on the head of a rattlesnake or and, and that's what this thing to the left is. It's just sort of a, I wanna know what I'm doing. Then the next, the, the little sketch below is me simply trying to figure out um, 
composition color on a tiny scale. If I'm painting a 10 foot by five foot watercolor, I can paint a 10 inch by five inch little piece of paper in a, in a few minutes and get a really good sense of whether it's gonna work. So by the time I launch into a big watercolor like this one, which is 10 feet by five feet, I'm not gonna, I kind of know it's gonna work out the way I want it to. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna invest a couple of months in painting scale detail or something and painting little landscape detail on something that I think is not headed where I want it to head. So I have to figure, so these are the kind of layers of study that I put in ahead of time. I want to study the animal, the detail, but I also want to study or I want to sort out composition, color, how I'm going to make the big one so that I'm not struggling with the process as I'm making. Because, you know, a big, a large scale watercolor, you make a mark on watercolor paper with watercolor paint, it's there. It doesn't go away. You can't come back the next day like an oil and scrape it out and start again. A watercolor process moves forward without being able to back up. It's like marble carving. There's certain things like that in art. You're moving forward. If you chip the nose off of a marble sculpture, it's gone. So with mine, it's like if I screw it up and a big blob of paint falls on the painting somewhere that it doesn't belong, I'm pretty much screwed. So uh, it, 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 not a lot of leeway. So that's why those studies are important. They set me up to not make a bunch of gross errors when I'm working on the thing that I really want it to turn out a certain way. And how do you transfer it? Do you just eye it? Everything is freehand and eyeballed. Yeah, I've never yeah. used no projection, no, no squaring, no grids, none of that yeah. shit. It, it, I need to stand up and make a big pencil gesture on a sheet of paper yeah. and then step back and then I can erase. And that's where my revisions come in in the pencil sketch before I start painting. One of the processes of watercolor is you can lay in a light pencil sketch mm. and just, you know, you can often see in a, say the masters of watercolor like Sargent and Winslow Homer, you'll see the pencil work underneath. Yeah. And then things often change because if people look carefully at the sketch, you can see at the bottom, there are two figures. Yes. But in the finished picture, there's a one person and you've added these yeah. wonderful little birds. I was just in Martinique and I was marveling at whenever you're at elevation, looking down and you see the birds flying around in the valleys. The bird. <laughs> yeah, and, but it also organizes scale for you, just looking. And Frederick Church understood that in so many of his big panoramic paintings. He always includes sort of soaring birds and you, you've added these in there as well. So just the And they're not figure. just any bird, they're mm -hmm. California condors, which are the largest flying birds on the planet. Right. So these are birds, these are birds that are nearly extinct, but range throughout the West at the time of Cabeza de Baca. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, they have a 12 foot wingspan. Um, so, I've actually seen, they have them in a Grand Canyon. They introduced a few back. I've seen them and it's like, you kind of think you're seeing a, a, a an airplane or a glider yeah. or something. Right. It doesn't seem possible that it's a bird. People should also notice the, um, just to get the details, the way that Walton works with the paper in areas uh, like the sun. Um, sometimes he doesn't apply any color to the surface. He just uses that sort of white of the paper, which is set off by the colors around it. And it becomes like a Turnerian, JMW Turner-like sun and there's sections of that, especially in the sky. Yeah, it's a fun trick. <laughs> I have like, they're, the tricks up my sleeve are quite old um, as far as the paintings are concerned, but the narratives are, are rather new. Yeah. Um, and the reason I, I narrowed it down to, there are only a few survivors, um, one, one of which was an African-American, I mean, not African-American, no, he was an Af enslaved African person um, who was accompanying the expedition. And he was one of the survivors. Um, and at first I was sort of interested in including him in the painting. And then I realized I, I could really only speak for one nightmare at a time. <laughs> Right. You know, and being a European, 
person myself. I was like the painting, Cabeza de Baca is the one that wrote it all down. And I just thought I would focus on his nightmare rather than say, include another figure in. So it feels very personal. Um, yeah. It's the sort of rational fear that a European person would have. So I would say also there's a third point of view that is going on in these paintings from my perspective, which is of course the viewer now in the present who's looking at it. So um, when I saw this painting the first time and the interaction between the figure seen from behind, almost like a figure of identification, uh, this massive figure, a snake, uh, here's what my crazy mind thought of, which was of oh, course, yeah. um, uh the the jennifer lopez vehicle anaconda i don't know if any of you've seen that 4.8 4.8 on the imdb yeah, it's one of the worst films ever except for fun i it's mean if you want to laugh at how bad it is it's yeah it's good <laughs> and to see what happens to eric stoltz uh -huh. <laughs> ice cube um 1997 and it was so bad that they made a sequel which is almost exactly the same plot as the first one they just had the new cast and they couldn't get yeah. the good cast Sure. anymore if but it doesn't work once. better and i know you're a big fan planet of the apes at the bottom and that idea of the astronauts who are thrown into this strange landscape who are denuded of their clothes they go swimming and the natives steal their clothes and then they are confronted by this image of gorillas who are hunting them in the cornfield so the first thing that my strange 70s mind thought of when i saw this scene was that mm. image of them sort of looking out at something unimaginable or nightmarish, which feels like it's come to life. It was definitely the same costume. <laughs> yes. And I think that's one of the joys of Walton's paintings is that you bring to it, not only do you marvel in his imagination and the way that he's done the homework and the research, uh, but also the way that they kind of interact with us and our, you know, sort of cinematic tendency is to see things as filmic um, and popular culture. Uh, and our own, of course, interactions with nature, which is so much a formidable part of this, these kinds of works. The pop culture stuff is definitely in there. I mean, the yeah. idea uh, that I grew up with sort of cheesy Hollywood movies and underground comics, and also just like the horror comics, like creepy and eerie comics that had Frank Frazetta covers and things like that. Yeah. They yeah. had, I make liberal use of, sort of pop culture in the imagery and film, and then mix it with natural history, traditional natural history imagery that you would find in like, uh, you know, Audubon type imagery like that, you know? So mm -hmm. it, it, there is this idea of, of, I do like to sort of not necessarily worry about whether it's in good taste or not, you know, or whether it feels like it's high art or if it looks a bit like a movie poster, that's okay with me. Because yeah. often movie posters will grab you quicker than contemporary art, you know? That can be true. So um, one of the standout works in this show is this one, do you pronounce it Che? Yeah, I, I, I suppose I could be pronouncing it way wrong, but che. yeah, I think so. It, it's Vietnamese word. Mm -hmm. That means it's the verb for burn. Um, and do you want me to tell this story? Well, yeah, I do. But let me just uh, let me just open it by saying, you know, here's a magnificent image of the tiger. Um, Walton's last show in New York was, and actually the last two shows, major shows, was really about lions. Um, the one at the top left was part of a show uh, at Gagosian in Beverly Hills in 2017 called uh, Calafia. And then the other three that you see here, these wonderful paintings, which were shown at Casman in 2018 in the show Barbary. Um, but now he has turned back to tigers, which has been a frequent subject uh, in your art. And I just want to give a shout out to my mother, Eileen Wolfer Rosenfeld, who's listening in Massachusetts, who is the biggest tiger fan I know on the planet. So she's nice. excited to hear about uh, these, even if the tigers don't, don't always come out winners. So here's an example of a painting of a, one of these uh, animals, but it also has a kind of historical reference. So yeah, please about this work too for us sure there's a wonderful vietnamese folktale of how the tiger got his stripes this concept of of a tiger without stripes is pretty 
common, I think, in Asia in general, um, that at one point the tiger had no stripes and was very proud of its smooth, unmarked coat. Um, and uh, the tiger was walking along and he saw a farmer uh, uh, beating an oxen and driving it through the fields. And when the farmer, the little tiny elderly farmer went away, um, the tiger went up to the oxen and said, how do you, why do you put up with this? Um, uh, uh, why do you let this little creature beat you like this? And the oxen said, well, he has a formidable weapon. And he goes, what's it called? And he says, intelligence. And the tiger calls out to the little farmer and says, what, what is this weapon? Show me this weapon intelligence that you have. And the farmer said, I'd be happy to, um, but I left it at home. And uh, I'll go get it now, but I have to tie you up to this tree first because you'll eat my oxen while I'm away. And the tiger's quite gullible. He hasn't interacted with human beings before. So um, he let, allows himself to be tied to the tree. And then the farmer starts stacking brush up around him and branches and everything, and then sets fire to this tiger um, tied up to the tree. And the tiger, the fire burns uh, black, chars black lines into the fur between the ropes. And eventually the ropes break and the tiger bursts free and the farmer says, that's my intelligence, how do you like it? And uh, the, there after that, according to the legend, the tiger stays away from man, fears man, stays in his part of the forest. And this is the way it goes forward. I just think, ah, uh, everything about that story is unbelievable. It's so great. It's, it's kind of a summation of, of our interactions with, with, with wild animals from the get-go, right? And, um, and yet it also always felt to me like a sort of me a very astute metaphor for, for the struggles that the Vietnamese people have had against the Chinese, the French, and the Americans, constantly uh, having to fight uh, uh, conquerors that try to take their country and they never succeed. Um, so uh, I did put the date of the last withdrawal of American troops, 0430, 1975, up in the corner next to the word Che, which means to be burned. And this is the sort of penultimate image of this, of a series of paintings I've done about this. I've painted the tiger without stripes. This was this was actually the very first, very stylized version of this uh, subject I did. This is the first large scale watercolor I ever did. Um, and uh, I didn't care to paint a realistic tiger at that point. There was no, I had very little interest in kind of selling the tiger. I wanted it to look like a 19th century misrepresentation, mm -hmm. awkward, you know, awkward rendering you know or like durs durs uh you know prints where sometimes the animals pre-photographic really is yeah. how i call it. i really was at this point in my career the most important thing for me was to try to channel a, a pre-photographic way of looking at animals mm -hmm. what would what would a sort of medieval person how you know how you know what i'm saying like a early renaissance image of a tiger or something yeah, because this one is supposed to take the whole history of Vietnam on. It's the similar subject. There's the tree with the ropes, mm -hmm. but there are human figures in the stripes in this one, and they represent different people throughout Vietnamese history. Either uh, yeah. people who, like Kennedy, is falling on the leg, and but there's also like uh, uh, heroic um, uh, Vietnamese warriors and people who fought the Chinese and right on the cheek, there's a little warrior with a sword. Yeah. yeah. So um, this was, this was when you first, <laughs> the first large scale watercolor I ever made, 10 foot by five foot watercolor I ever made. I wanted to pack everything I learned into the single image. And now mm. I'm kind of give myself a break, like in the sense that I can make a series of paintings and the story can unfold over time. And that an artist creates a kind of atmosphere there's not a single, say, Francis Bacon painting that has all the elements that I like about Francis Bacon in it. But there are a lot of elements that I like about a Francis Bacon painting that add up to a sort of mood. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. 
And here also people should note that, you know, stylistically you can see things have, have how things have shifted into the present. We'll show some details of the new works. Steve, yeah. This, this looks like a, a colored lithograph, you know, it yeah, has it's that, a very different feel. It, I, I like it a, a lot, but I don't, yeah. I don't, I'm not quite painting like that anymore. <laughs> It's good when you like your old, your older work. <laughs> I mean, like things like perspective weren't important, like the tongue, yeah. jaw, yeah. it doesn't actually fit together. It was more yeah. like I was taking things and sort of flattening them out. Yeah. But yeah. the thing is, I, I've had people say, oh, you've gotten so much better at drawing. It's like, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to right. paint in a naturalistic way. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, yeah. You're, you're in complete control of this kind of thing. Yeah. There's another one before this is we can maybe go the back last, to check. Uh, this would be the last moment in the whole story where mm -hmm. the tiger's finally getting relief. Um, his, it, the fire has been put out. He's jumped into a Vietnamese river and is allowing, and he turns back and says, oh, you know, this is, I don't like this man's intelligence. Um, <laughs> right. What does it mean, Ho Van? The, the... That means uh, tiger stripes. Okay. So, yeah. uh, and the dates starting in 55. That's, that's the same, same Vietnamese inter the, the, our interaction, uh, the American involvement, which was, yeah. which Vietnamese people assure me is the least worrisome compared to say China, which is right. always the terror. Or the French. Well, uh, like so back, I back heard to... from Vietnamese people, like, we don't worry about America because we know you're not coming back. <laughs> you know, except as a friend, um, but yeah. Chinese are constantly threatening us. Um, or as tourists. Yeah, we'll, we'll take your money, fine. Yeah, it's exactly. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the tiger's magnificent. You know, they're monumental. They're extraordinary looking. And I think, you know, the, the one thing uh, that is, that has evolved, one of the things that has evolved in addition to everyone can see the more gestural brushwork, the visible brushwork, which is a stand-in for fur, of course, but is also you know, kind of empathy on the faces, which you can really see they're they're humanized to a degree. We, we, we understand them as feeling beings, I guess you would say, uh, which is not the way that Durer would have thought about an animal. Although, he, you know, with the rabbit, he gets it. <laughs> he likes the rabbit. Bad at painting, no, rabbit, bad at cats though. The bad rabbit has no, um, the rabbit has nothing that, or the hair that he painted. Yeah, I couldn't say that there is anything about that that I would change. No, that's um, a, one of the great watercolors ever. Yeah, so it's sort of like every, everybody's humbled in the presence of a thing like that. Here's um, one more tiger that um, we saw recently from tigers. 2013. Yeah, tigers. he... This she, is a beautiful painting. Thank you. Yeah. So she was... There's another medieval... In a medieval bestiary from about the 12th century... They mm. describe uh, tiger hunting and in a fanciful way. It's a fantasy tiger hunt. They describe, they say, if you're on horseback, you can steal one of the tiger's cubs, the tigress's cubs. And as you're galloping away, if you throw glass balls behind you, reflective balls, mm. mirrored glass balls behind you, that the Tigress will look into the ball, see her reflection, think it's her own cub and be fooled and stop and try to nurse it and you'll get away. It's the most absurd kind of <laughs> bestiary advice you could ever get. But, you know, I, it ends up being a metaphor for Christ's this and that. I mean, that's how a lot of the bestiaries were. They were, they were set up as fables to allow you to understand a biblical teaching. Mm. That aside, I thought if you were the last tigress on earth, Basically, everything thrown at you would be these reflective balls. No more real cubs, nothing left. She's, I painted the last tigress and all she has is these illusions. And they're not just being thrown by a horseman. They're coming down from the sky like yeah. rain. All, all just uh, the futility of extinction. And, and she's enraged. So the painting is a, is a warning. <laughs> Uh, I don't usually get as heavy handed with my environmental messages, but in this one, it felt like, why not? I don't yeah, know. I think they're intuitive in these in these works. Um, and there's some really beautiful painting of these 
orbs, which is a, a, like you say, there's a kind of religious metaphor in these orbis mundi, the idea of the mm -hmm. the world in a in a whether a glass ball or because they're kind of floating, they're like bubbles, and the you background is a reflect. field of these balls, like yeah. a it's like a Kus Kusama installation. She stole this from you <laughs> when she saw this, the tigress, Why all these balls. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mom, that's it for the tigers. So let's uh, talk about the cygnets, how are, uh, the swans, which is uh, extraordinary painting. I, I was I was standing in front of this with my students for a long time, uh, talking about this work. It, it operates on uh, many different levels and the story is something I had never heard of before. Um, so Signota uh, from 2020. What's up with these funky looking swans? Yeah, the, the, the mute swan is the European, basically the European wild swan, most common. Um, in England, it was a prerogative of, of, of uh, aristocratic houses to serve a swan at a banquet. A commoner was not allowed to do so. So the aristocratic houses had ways of marking the swans on their beak with basically uh, essentially a brand kind of thing or a tattoo. They would strip the flesh away from the beak in a certain pattern and then put pigment in there. Presumably there's not very many descriptions of how it was done, but there's many, many swan, what they call swan rolls in museums. And yeah, which show these are di uh, diagrams of the beaks of swans with the various houses uh, markings uh, delineated and they were as a keeper of the swans who 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 you had to uh, account to and if, if your swans were unmarked then they became automatic property of the king and it was all of this kind of thing so just yet another kind of uh, attempt to seize uh, common property from from the people and put it in the hands of the few and um, and mark the swans in this way for that and uh, lots of laws involved in this and prosecutions and all kinds of bizarre stories connected with the marking of swans, which was an annual event, which had to be overseen by the master of the swans. So that's this little study where I just want to get the shape of the beak right. I want to make sure I'm, I'm figuring that out. You, you want to get your swan anatomy down before you start a big picture like this. I have, um, but I thought about how the Brit I thought about doing a series of a British Empire expand expanding British Empire series where I had these marked swans going all over the world, going to India and going to Africa, mm. trying to control the native birds and um, having a, 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 a hard time you know, managing that, you know. Um, so I mean, but a bit I, like I, the, the last show Barbary with the lions was uh, extraordinary meditation on the British Empire and um, yeah, it's symbolism and the way like you're talking about how it spread all around and, and uh, it's pernicious influence in some instances. Yeah, there was so. there was a bit of that in that show for sure, because they use the lines yeah. as a symbol in the same way. I thought these are the perfect uh, sort of the swans themselves are sort of the perfect representations of the kind of people that fought for the empire. They, there's no real benefit in it for them, but there's mm. tremendous uh, imperial pride. And, um, you know, they've been marked and owned and then sent out into the world to like do the bidding of these aristocratic houses and bring the wealth to the few. Um, and they're, they're fighting in trenches and going out into places they, they were getting malaria and dying to support some system that in many ways didn't benefit them at all. So I thought that swans were a good metaphor for that. Um, they're going to end up cooked on the table, but they're, but they're proud of their little beak marks. And they don't even taste good, apparently. I wouldn't think so. Yeah, they don't. No, it's, it's really tough meat, apparently. It's just, it makes sense. Big, powerful dude. bird. But yeah. the queen still owns them all. The queen owns the swans on like an eighty-mile stretch of the Thames. I river. do think that there's a grandfathered provision in there. You know that she doesn't exercise like a lot of the stuff that the how yeah. yeah well i read that the last time that someone was uh prosecuted for the crime of killing a swan was in 2006 he was mm. a welsh he was a welsh muslim 
named Mia, and he broke his Ramadan feast with the Feast of Swan. He stabbed one by a boating pond with a knife in 2006 and was caught carrying it home in a plastic bag. And he, his quote to the police was, I was so hungry. And then he said, I hate the queen. And he got two months in jail. Wow. 2006, yeah. So wow. it's still on the books. Still on the books. I wonder if he hated the queen before he killed the swan. <laughs> Hard to say. Or if it was part of hating the queen. He didn't even get to eat it. I love yeah. the 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 design of this work is remarkable because the left side is so frenetic and chaotic. It reminds me of like the Hydra with all of its mm -hmm. heads. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want it to seem like a single beast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels like that, a single massive beast in its lair. And then the right side is super pastoral, the traditional mm -hmm. uh, English pastoral with the little parish church. I'll show you a, um, a comparative to naturally I'm going to throw a pre-Raphaelite painting in there, yes. but John Everett Millet is great. A dream of the past, Sir Isambras at the Ford, a great failure in his 1850s period, 1857, because he couldn't get the horse right. Um, but that beautiful sort of image of the little, the you know, the English village church in the gloaming here in the yeah, background. Yeah, it's almost the same exact church, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. It is the same church, yeah without all the mist but this is a bad horse he struggled with the horse really badly but the greatest painting i know about swans and the river and it, it occurred to me when i was there is this one by the kook yeah. of all kooks stanley spencer swan upping at cookham and upping was when they used to mark the swans the upping of the swans is the name of the marking ceremony by the time stanley spencer saw it it wasn't about marking them as much on the beak right i uh it was uh i believe they had a different uh method maybe it was even just a little uh clipping of little, the wings. yeah like a, maybe a little nick and now they put i think they put little thing bands around their feet yeah i think it's like a banding thing or something but the upping still goes on once mm. a year and this is an image of it um the traditional thing it's frustrating because they don't quite know how they applied the marks to the beak mm. um some people say it was a brand like a hot iron like but that doesn't make a lot of sense when you see the shape of the beak like how would you get it yeah. to go across evenly um the I, stripping of the skin seems more likely but there's very little there's engravings that show the upping of the swans when they were still marking the beaks and there's this sort of frustrating little scrum of men holding the swan down mm. and you can't see what they're doing <laughs> it, it, it's like I so I just I had pictures I just used the imagery that I had and made the yeah. best guess I could do the heraldic stuff the heraldic stuff's really interesting apparently it was based on the actual coat of arms of the families sometimes really not, simplified, always. not always not always simplified designs yeah sometimes yeah. the coat of arms but not always not always yeah. not always sometimes it was uh, like a key or a or a music yeah. instrument or a this or a that that didn't that didn't appear in the coat of arms, but often huh. it had a relationship to the coat of arms. It, it, they're all, it's all over the map. It, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of these things. Amazing. Yeah, it's a story I didn't know about it. So this is one of the great I things have about the your work. Book. It's called The Mute Swan in England and it has all of this. They don't make any noise, Walton? They're they, actually... make, they make noise, but they just oh. got the name Mute Swan. That's, that's often the case. People call Fisher cats, if you've ever heard of that. That's yeah. a it's basically a large weasel that's no, not a cat and it doesn't go fishing. So, you know, it's, it's like- uh, a, It's like an egg cream. Yeah, right? No egg, no cream. Exactly, you got it. Let's keep with the birds and I want to do it a little bit around the other way here. So here is a study, Walton, Golden Eagle study for painting called More Than a Mile, which I'm going to show you after we kind of talk about the story of this wonderful, majestic looking uh, image of, a, of an eagle and its talons. And maybe yeah. let's let's awesome. go this direction instead Good of job. starting with yours. I love this direction. This is the best direction. Thank you. Mm. Uh, Audubon wanted to paint a golden eagle for the birds of America. This is his watercolor of that eagle. Um, in the in the print that was made afterwards, uh, Audubon doesn't appear, but he appears in in this watercolor crossing a log in the white mountains of new hampshire with the e with the actual eagle on his back so it's a pretty cool like meta image it's like mm. uh you know one of these things like you see in medieval painting where you have 
you know, before and after in the same image. So the fact is a hunter trapped this golden eagle in the White Mountains. He would set a fox trap and it caught the eagle by one of its talons. And the eagle dragged the trap for more than a mile through the White Mountains of New Hampshire because they're super powerful animals. And um, the trap was weighted down with a branch or a log and the eagle was able to drag it. Um, Audubon then, the, 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 uh, the farmer then brought the eagle to a market where Audubon bought it, actually brought it to Boston and, and sold it in Boston to Audubon. But Audubon made it look as if he went to the White Mountains and killed it himself with his gun and then at great danger brought it back to civilization. That's why he painted himself like that in the background. Anyhow. Um, he bought it while it was alive. It was still alive. He bought it while it was alive. So he, he wanted to paint it without destroying its feathers. So he, he then proceeded to basically torture this poor eagle. He put it in a smokehouse and tried to smoke it to death. Then he put sulfur on the flames to try to gas it to death with like poison gas. It didn't die. It kept living and living and living and just staring at him balefully every time he'd open the door of the smokehouse. So he finally just took a, spiel, a, a steel rod pin and he drove it into the breast of the bird and killed it finally. Then he spent about two weeks painting it in February in a cold shed because he didn't want it to rot. It was cold. You know, it kept preserve the bird. He posed it like this on, you know, dead and then, you know, proceeded to draw it. Um, and he fell ill and got delirious. And I've made pictures about, about Audubon's delirium and the bird's delirium while it was being tortured by Audubon, kind of combining in an image. But I also, in this painting, I did more than a mile. It's the other POV that I haven't been able to talk about yet, in, which is purely the point of view of the suffering of this actual animal. I just wanted you to identify strictly with the bird. So it's, this is the White Mountains in New Hampshire in February. This is the eagle having dragged the trap more than a mile. You see its track in the background. The fox that was the trap was intended for has followed the eagle this mile and is just sort of waiting for it to die. So it might get a little eagle feast. And I just wanted you to be right there with this eagle and his sort of ordeal. This is what it means to be a sub to pose for an Audubon painting in, in for the animal itself. It's it, so there isn't any almost like drama or comment. There's just a simple acknowledgement of the facts of the case. And here they are. And that's sometimes what I want to do. I just want to respect and honor the animal itself. I had a crazy conversation with um, Robert Thurman, who is the Buddhist scholar, uh, also the father of Uma Thurman, but he, he runs Tibet house with Nena, his wife, and they, they're amazing people. And he's told me that my incarnation was to, to make these paintings for the animals, that the animals were in control of the narrative, not me, that it was not my ego and it was not my talent and it was not Walton Ford that was coming up with these ideas at all, that the animals need to tell these stories and they are using me to tell them. Um, and I thought, wow, at first I was like, wow, you know, it felt like, oh, I'll take mushrooms, you know? Um, um, I didn't take it seriously. But then I kind of did, you know what I mean? I thought there's no way that if I take on this idea, it's gonna be a detriment to my painting. It's gonna make the painting better. If I'm honoring the animal as much as Robert Thurman thinks it's my responsibility to do, so at first I sort of fake it until I make it. But then when I start painting it like this, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to do my damnedest to, to, to get, to honor this Eagle story. You know, Audubon wrote his own story down. The Eagle didn't have a chance to yeah. write. Audubon painted his version of this that makes our hero out of him crossing a ravine and the Eagle doesn't get to, be represented. So my idea is like, give it, give it to the eagle, 
you know, yeah. and it's 10 feet by five feet because I wanted to get the full wingspan in. So I take the minutia of the Eagles ordeal and that as described by Audubon in a single paragraph mm. and blow it up and monumentalize it and make a kind of secular altarpiece to this eagle. Right. I'd say, you know, this was the story that horrified my students when I took them and told it's them about horrifies Audubon. anybody. It's like it's a horrifying, dark right? fucking it's, story. It's just, and he's the a horrible story, person, Audubon. You know, <laughs> and he, the quest for art, you know, and the natural world goes by the wayside at the same time that he's trying to preserve it for a kind of eternity. It's, it's amazing. It's the only, just the, the only, perfectly complex mm. historical story that we need to be listening to. Yeah. We don't want, I don't want any kind of sanitized version of who Audubon right. was or how right. he did his work. I'll read the little bit that he writes about the bird as he was had the bird in his possession. He wrote, I must acknowledge that as I watched his eye and observed his looks of proud disdain, I felt towards him not so generously as I ought to have done. Uh, at times I was half inclined to restore to him his freedom that he might return to his native mountains. Nay, I several times thought how pleasing it would be to see him spread out his broad wings and sail away towards the rocks of his wild haunts. But then, reader, someone seemed to whisper that I ought to take the portrait of the magnificent bird, and I abandoned the more generous design of setting him at liberty for the express purpose of showing you his semblance. Perfect. So, Audubon's not working to honor the animal. He's working for him in a much more sort of devilish way. The only, the only thing yeah. that I can say that might make people feel better is that the conservation status of the golden eagle is least concern according to uh, the National Wildlife uh, Federation. So the population sure. is stable. It's pretty cool because they're an apex predator. They can kill anything. Right. They use in Mongolian uh, tribal peoples and there's a group of people that use them to hunt wolves on yeah. horseback. Wow. You can kill a wolf with a golden eagle. They have a... They have these the structure to their foot where they have like a five inch talon or something like that in the back thumb and then like a two inch one in the middle here. And when they pinch, they just basically sever the spinal cord of whatever they catch. They it's not possible to it's like a tiger. You can't defend yourself against a golden eagle. It's like a tiger that flies right. the claws, the work, the business end of the eagle are the two claws. And they're as bad as any lion mouth or tiger mouth you could ever, even worse, because they can move around and it. <laughs> and they see everything. They can see everything. Yeah. And they distance. can come at you at like, you know, a, a, a hundred miles an hour from the yeah. sky. I mean, it's yeah. just, there's nothing you can do if one of these decides it wants to. It, they don't attack people and they don't attack things bigger than themselves. Usually right. they can be right. trained to do so. But there's nothing in a weird way. There's almost nothing that a golden eagle can't can't deal with. It, it's Amazing. so it makes sense in a way that they aren't in trouble because they have a tremendous uh, range of food uh, options open to them. Everything yeah. that's below them on the ground is basically uh, the food, the banquet. You know, like a yeah. you know a steam table for them. You know, this is like okay. You know, what do I, I like? I want rabbit. Do I want a bird to the turkey whatever it is i'm looking at i could probably get it <laughs> and unlike the bald eagle we didn't try to hunt them to extinction Our yeah and bald bird... eagles are scavengers essentially they're sort of yeah. big seagulls they just eat the stuff right. that washes up on the beach you know right but the golden eagle is an active hunter and one of the most powerful ones in the world yeah speaking of beaches um this is my favorite work from the show uh stack and armin which is extraordinary vertical uh, work of large scale, much taller than me, um, with this uh, image of the great auk and uh, another horrible story of human <laughs> inanity and, 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 you know, and superstition and right. just the depravity of human existence. I mean, you know, we're seeing in Ukraine, obviously, what humans do to humans, but what humans do to animals uh, in perpetuity is just awful. Um, so here he is, the great auk, the last in Britain. Um, enlighten us about this picture. 
Yeah, the, one of the very last um, sightings of a great auk, which is an extinct uh, bird, they stood about three feet tall. They looked like big penguins. They're not related to penguins. They're actually a sort of puffin, really, like a large puffin, if you know what that mm -hmm. is. And um, But they were flightless birds that their job was the same job as a penguin in in it, it, it was the Arctic version. They kind of fly underwater like a penguin and catch fish. So they evolved the same layout, a uh, white breast, black back, a sort of layout that's very efficient for catching fish underwater. This animal happened to have really uh, good uh, downy feathers that were good for mattresses and quilts and things like that. And also uh, was okay to eat. Um, and was plentiful and flightless, so it was easy to kill. Um, so it was sort of doomed the minute people discovered these big islands that they nested on. Um, they would just go there and help themselves. Stack on Amman, as you can see, I didn't exaggerate in my painting how fucking brutal this is. <laughs> this is a, 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 a part of the St. Kilda group. It's an archipelago of islands about 50 miles off the coast of Scotland. And it was one of the most remote uh, European inhabited European spots. It, 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 it's out. The people were outrageously isolated. The people who lived on these islands, because there's no, uh, you can't get to and from the mainland from these islands. As you can see, there's no place to dock a boat or anything. The few people that lived on these islands lived, uh, off of the birds. They would gather the eggs and the chicks and the adult birds that lived on the islands. And they would do a little bit of fishing and they kept some sheep. But aside from that, they saw nothing of the outside world. They'd never been in a second story house, never seen a printed book that had illustrations in it, had never seen a horse or a carriage or, or a street in a village or anything like that. So these people were like, but they were introduced to a very strict kind of Christianity in the 18th century. And they adopted it with wholeheartedly a terrifying kind of, image of the world as being full of sin and and people as being irredeemable and you just had to pray and weep and hope that god would spare you for all the sinful thoughts that were running through your head so they went to church like every day to the detriment of their own nutrition <laughs> and um eventually the islands were felt to be by the british government so benighted that they evacuated them they just said no no more we got to get the people off of there um, they're not getting anywhere. <laughs> it's not working for them. Yeah. Anyhow, one of the very last great ox was, was discovered on, on Stack on Oman. It was just resting on a ledge. The, the four of the peoples, the native peoples there, discovered it. And they were, um, they didn't know what it was because the animal had essentially gone extinct over decades before. And, and this was really one of the very last survivors probably. They captured the bird, they tied it up, and they kept it for three days in a little shack that they had on this island. And it was squawking and had, trying to bite them and cut the ropes they tied it up with. And then a big storm blew up, and they decided it was a witch. They decided this thing was a witch. And so they stoned it to death, you know, naturally. So my idea was to get inside the heads of these people, and I created a witch's Sabbath a sort of brutal um, kind of like uh, a vision that where all of the beasts and demons and the witches' Sabbath would be animals that lived around the North Atlantic islands that we're talking about. So there's orcas and gannets and seals. And I also imagined in the, in the detail that you have on the screen now, in the lower right-hand corner, there's a young woman carrying Pete in a basket and oh, yeah. I imagined these sort of four fishermen who found this auk had a sort of lustful fixation on this poor woman. Mm -hmm. And they blame, they call the auk a witch based on their fear of their desire for her. And so the, her naked image is above the auk in the same position that the auk is, as yeah. you see very faintly. People, I succeeded in something that, I didn't think was necessarily possible in this painting. And that was to put a naked body in a painting and have it not be the first thing you see. Um, <laughs> there's a kind of a interesting uh, 
Bresson, the filmmaker who made this film about a donkey called Balthazar, this great French filmmaker of the 50s, 40s and 50s, he said, hide the most important thing in your work of art, but hide it so people can see it or can find it. And so I believe I did that here. This idea that the whole witch concept has so much to do with male, uh, male fear of what they perceive as women's power and women's relationship to nature in a way that men don't understand. And so I wanted to personify that. So the wild animals that live around Stack and Armand are sort of in this, uh, are pulling up the storm to sort of in the imaginations of these fearful men. And um, I wanted to somehow uh, do that. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, uh, yeah, you have exotic, you know, extinct beasts at the bottom and all these other kinds of creatures. Well, they're it's all animals that you would see in, in, in Stack yeah. and Armand, actually. There's a, yeah. a sheep that they, yeah. they sheep. There's the skeleton of an auk. There's an yeah. eel, there's an orca, there's yeah, canids, awesome. there's seals, there's sharks. Yeah. There's uh, a, a golden eagle actually way up top. Mm -hmm. um, these so are I all things that they were familiar with on the island. They couldn't have created a witch's Sabbath in their head out of anything else. The, right. the witch's Sabbaths you see with Goya have animals that people on the mainland would know. Right. Um, and right. generally more uh, traditional uh, demonic beasts like bats and snakes and snails and toads. But yeah. none of those things lived on Stack and Armand. But I did imagine that the men on these islands were as afraid of the animals as they were of their own lusts and their own fear of hell and damnation yeah. and sex. Yeah, so. yeah it's the, this is the temptation of St. Anthony Yes. North, north of Scotland. That's in, what it reminds in, yes, me. Yes, exactly. In the minds of people who have never seen anything outside yeah. of their tiny island group. Right. And, you know, the great thing about it is that you have that little figure at the bottom, but you don't really need to show the islanders to, to communicate this sort of uh, gothic horror that they are. It's all in their brains. And then they, they yeah. stone this poor, this poor flightless animal. I know. It's appalling. And weirdly, right. they used to set very large fires on these islands um, uh -huh. to, boil, to, to actually cook the ox because they would, but not to eat them, but to put them in boiling water to loosen the feathers, to pluck them, to bail up the feathers, to send them back to the mainland right. for beds. Right. I don't know if you've read this book by Harari Sapiens. Yeah, um, I've, I've, I have it and I didn't read it because everyone else was reading it and that yeah. annoys me. <laughs> yeah, well, I agree. It's it's not a completely successful. You've got to read book. this, and I'm like, that's the perfect way to not get me to read a book. But I'm gonna I'm gonna get around to it once it. Well, the, off. the most gripping part of it for me was the beginning when he talks about how humans have systematically destroyed all the megafauna on the planet. Basically, everything big has been killed because they were lumbering sloths or whatever and they were easy pickings mastodons etc which would feed clothe and house a whole village for uh, months you know and that eventually we're just going to be left with cows and that's it we're going to kill sort of all a, the elephants and everything else because I we're did a painting horrible about race that. i did a painting about that for the gagosian show called la brea mm. and it's uh the tar pits right you can't really talk about that now but it has the megafauna in it and it and it sort of makes a reference to the our, the jam we have now with petrochemicals and it's yeah. the idea that that's one of the first global extinction events that's really documented that we wiped out the megafauna that's in yeah. La Brea tar pits and then it comes out of a petro it's been preserved in a petrochemical sump basically weirdly and then I have the animals coming out of the La Brea tar pits and attacking. LA, which has bad air pollution. So the whole thing sort of comes full circle. We're going to get it. That's a 30 foot long painting, right? It's yeah. three, <laughs> yeah, it's three, it's three separate picture. Well, a triptych basically 30 mm -hmm. feet long. It's one of the great works of the decade, I would say. Oh, everyone okay. should check it out. It, it looks awesome. like it'll end up if with, if all goes well, it'll end up in the LA County Museum. It looks Excellent. Like right down the street from La Brea. Let's go. Yeah. Hope. Yeah. So I love the tonalities also of this painting. And it reminds me of this one, which I hadn't seen before. I don't know where it is now, 
the flaming field germany i showed that at max hetzler gallery in berlin okay this is from two years ago um with this image of uh vesuvius and the Fl uh, flagrian fields west of naples um and you know there's something different about these two works right they're they're more sort of calculatedly in a good way dramatic um it's less of what you were talking about with the golden eagle where you're just letting the story tell itself here you're building it you're really building it and using color and light and chiaroscuro and everything uh the possibilities of the medium which you might not think possible on a large scale this intensity of color uh it's extraordinary and that amazing face so I, on a personal level i just want to hear you talk about this painting on the left because i wish i'd seen it sure um Sir William Hamilton was the British ambassador to Naples in the mm -hmm. 18th century. Um, and he was a famous, uh, he, he, was, he was one of the promoters of a sort of neoclassical uh, aesthetic in England, you know, mm -hmm. um, and he donated a giant or actually sold a gigantic collection of vases to the British Museum. Um, he also was a, vul a vulcanist. He was a, he studied volcanoes. Um, and Vesuvius was erupting during his time in Naples when he was the ambassador there. But also he had a pet monkey that he had gotten from some, I, he even described the monkey enough for me to know that it was this type of monkey, which is a sort of uh, a, a, kind of, a, a kind of macaque um, that lives in India. Anyhow, and he named his monkey Jack, and Jack was sort of a, a perverse monkey. He would he would grab uh, uh, William Hamilton's male servants by their testicles and then smell his fingers, and he would do all these things antics. And he functioned as a sort of um, he functioned as a sort of court jester for for William Hamilton, who loved this monkey. And when the monkey died, he grieved the monkey tremendously, like it was a human being. Um, so I, I've done a few paintings of Jack just because he interests me. When William Hamilton's monkey in Naples during the 18th century and his <laughs> role in that sort of world. So Jack is is since he had these sort of homoerotic interactions with with um, with Wim, William Hamilton's uh, uh, servants. I, I I had him uh, climbing one of Hamilton's uh, uh, sculptures, and um, he's got a. a a sort of phallic, uh, well, like for lack of a better, like Pompeian dildo in his hand, and there's a <laughs> broken uh, uh, telescope kind of down below, yeah. and he's been in. He's a mischievous monkey. He's getting up to no good, <laughs> and Vesuvius is erupting. And this, I just sort of wanted a POV of William Hamilton coming around the corner, and ah, oh, Jack, you're at it again, you know. Um, <laughs> So that's it. I did an image of Jack on his deathbed where he's sort of like yeah. a little bocce or something. He looks yeah. very decadent. Yeah. Um, it was a Does he feature in um, Susan Sontag's book, The Volcano Lover? I don't believe I can't that remember. Susan Sontag mentions Jack. Ah, she overlooked Jack in that. That's she a overlooked great book. Jack. She, yeah, the book is cool. And it's um, great. It helped, the volcano turn lover. On, it helped turn me on to the whole William Hamilton story, yeah. which is gone into in great depth in a book called Fields of Fire. Um, uh, so. I can't remember the author of Fields of Fire, but it's a popular history book about William Hamilton that I read. Yeah. And Emma Hamilton's a fascinating character yeah. who I'm going to probably make paintings about since yeah. she posed as Circe sometimes and things yeah. like that. So I'm going to, I haven't finished with these guys yet. They're a fascinating bunch. She was married to William Hamilton, but had an affair with, uh, Nelson, the, uh, yeah. um, Anyway, so it went and on. George Romney, the painter, also yeah, was there was, was a scandalous figure. Yeah, it's a great story. Well, here I think the Vivian. animal has the upper hand in this one on every. Yeah, the animal is definitely the animal was given run of the of the place. The animal yeah. was was uh, I can't. I think Jack died probably because he wasn't getting the care that he needed yeah. as a macaque in Naples, perhaps, but. I, I, from what I can understand, he he had a run of of at least he had some fun while he was yeah. alive. He didn't he didn't seem like the kind of captive animal that was one of my biggest nightmare stories. You know what I mean? Right. He had 
run of the palace and he was doing right. whatever the hell he pleased and and william hamilton thought he was hilarious you know if macaques made movies they would make a movie about jack jack is a pretty interesting character clearly uh do you want to talk about one more do you want to talk about the giraffe yeah if the people can... aren't falling asleep they must be we could talk about the giraffe and then Jeez, i can see questions. almost everybody's still here it's just <laughs> yeah no it's 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 wonderful it's great to hear you talk about the works and you know unpacking them in a way which uh, is you know it's not so obvious when you're standing in front of them you have to do your own work to kind of get into them a bit this one's um, kind of easy because yeah. the quote is quite simple that i base the painting on um so just to show people here's a sketch Here's the small, it looks weird on the screen because it's so big, but this is the small watercolor in the back room. And here's the big painting that you see here in situ in the gallery uh, called yeah, Distinguished Stranger. Yeah, it, it, it's cool for me to see it all together like this because I don't generally. Um, I, I had this, uh, a, a di uh, there's a guy called Sir Philip Hone and he kept a diary in the 1820s, 30s and 40s in New York City. And one of his entries for in the month of July in, a, I think, 1835, he, he says he went and saw a giraffe, the first of its kind brought to North America. And it was being displayed on Broadway below Prince Street, he said, in a tent that was all fixed up. And people were paying money to go see it. And they said, he said, many persons uh, lined up to see this, the, to view the distinguished strangers. There was two giraffes that survived the journey from South Africa to New York out of 11. They were uh, captured in South Africa. They were put on a ship, probably a packet ship that mm -hmm. then sailed for New York. And the conditions were such that two of them lived and nine of them died on the journey. Um, when I read a story like that, it's just a paragraph in a, in a journal. I'm like, well, well, I need to figure out what went on for real. So this is very much the same POV as the eagle painting. I'm, I want you to go there with this giraffe. What was it like? What did that mean to be transported at great expense is the way it was put in the diary to America, one of only two survivors. I mean, you would have been able to store, you wouldn't have been able to store a giraffe below deck. So it would have been exposed the whole time. It would have had to be tethered in some way. It would have had to not be standing up. It would have had to sit probably the entire journey um, because a giraffe isn't going to feel very steady on its, on its legs and not to mention the height and the riggings and stuff. So I just painted this animal suffering through this thing. Giraffes have this sort of look on their face, which seems very calm, you know, but that's like we also look at a at a dolphin and see it smiling. You know, you don't really know what the animal's going through. Um, uh, it's not going to be dramatic. I like to. I think a lot of people. How can I say? There's only a few really dramatic uh, animal images in my show. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 many people, if they were going to paint Cabez de Baca's nightmare, would probably paint the rattlesnake up and doing its striking position. But my idea is it's asleep. It's more dramatic that way. I wanted to just show this sort of what is what, is, what does it take to survive? It takes a sort of acceptance. It mm -hmm. takes a sort of just, OK, I'm going to eat the hay they give me. I'm going to sit on the deck until I can't anymore and we'll hope for the best. And um, so that's the distinguished stranger. So it's pretty simple. Again, a more of a documentary image. I tried to get the ship right. I tried to yeah. get this. But I also wanted to give you with this by doing a rather Japanese composition where you've taken the picture plane and brought it up a little, yeah. like, you know, rather than have the pick go like this a bit with the surface of the ship mm -hmm. as it's brought, going across the waves, it gives you this sort of queasy. I felt like I was almost seasick when I was painting it, you know? <laughs> and there's an amazing heaviness to the bottom of it conveyed by the rump of the animal. Yeah, and like, yeah, this- ugh. Opens up at the top, the peak of the clouds. You the almost imagine her sliding a little bit. And yeah. Sliding forward. Like yeah. she's just gotta fucking deal with this. Yeah. When we were discussing this in the gallery, the uh, idea of a slave narrative, 
perspective metaphor, you know, came up in terms of a transportation across the sea, unwilling participant, someone in, you know, kind of chained yeah, and down. A, and a tremendous uh, attrition death rate, you know, right. like it, it's not, yeah, it's not, yeah, there are, you know, the conquest is it, it involved animals, plants, and human beings. Yeah. Um, and, and the story, the age of exploration, as it's often talked about it from a European standpoint, that starts in the 15th century and goes right forward into the 19th, um, you know, was a time of, of tremendous amount of of transportation of, of animals and plants as well right. as human beings. So, uh, an absolute misapprehension of those things, you know, yeah. European misunderstanding of what it took to even have a captive animal like this. There wouldn't have been any research into the eating habits and the biology of a giraffe. You would just yeah. take it on the deck, start feeding it stuff and hope for the best. And, um, you know, I guess, you know, for two of them, it worked, you know? Yeah. Uh, and they disappear from the record after they are this. Really? I, I have a beautiful uh, engraving that is a, essentially a poster, a broadside for the display mm. of these giraffes that's yeah. in the New York Public Library. Gorgeous thing. Huh. And then this diary entry and pretty much nothing else. So nothing, who knows what happened to them in the 1830s after that? Yeah. They might have been played for a few weeks and died there. Amazing to think they were just a few blocks from where you are. They were like where the old yeah. Dean DeLuca used to be or yeah. something. You know, it's exactly. so trippy. Extraordinary history. And, you know, I think about those Jerome paintings of giraffes and the giraffes that were brought from Africa for the Colosseum and the Roman Empire. But it's still going on in the early 19th century. These exotic yeah. animals being brought not close, you know, from South Africa. From South York, Africa to, I did one painting about another painting about this giraffe, mm. um, where it's being unloaded in in like South Street kind of. Yeah. You know, I have old images and it shows all the ships and stuff. Yeah. So Incredible. this was a subject I visited a couple of times as well. Yeah, it, the the face of this one is deeply moving. I think it's partly like you say, just the face of a giraffe. Those heavy lids of the eyes, which give him a sense yeah. of sort of regal regality, maybe. Um, I mean, even the you, guy, Philip Hone, in the diary, he goes, these beautiful creatures, these yeah. distinguished strangers, yeah. he can't help but praise them. They're, there's something about a giraffe that just gets you. They're yeah. so beautiful. They really are. It doesn't and make so, any sense. So bizarre. And there are spots on this particular type. Again, I do the research like there's yeah. about, I didn't know it, but there's about five different ways that a giraffe can be spotted depending on mm. where in Africa they're from. Yeah. So this is what you find in South Africa. Yeah. It's uh, what they call more of a reticulated spot. It's got like indentations in it, you know, it's yeah, irregular, that. but there's some yeah. that are just almost perfect hexagons and things like that. And yeah. then they're, you know, anyway, they come in all different flavors. Yeah. Amazing. yeah. Amazing. All right. The powers that be are asking us for one more. Yes, picture. please. Oh, one really? more. So we let's, yes. Because we one, need to open more. it up for people to ask questions, don't we? Blah, blah, blah. Well, let's talk about this for a second, because I think this is the most, uh, you know, in some ways, a very challenging picture um, this is dark. in the show. Yeah, dark and macabre, um, and uh, in a, in a way, the animals sort of mimic human um, behavior. Rob. Yeah. Can you the can grab the 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 Dichayu book that's right over there? It's it's right on the table. It's the one with the the cover that's all fancy. You got it. My thank you so much. I want to show maybe Jason's never even seen this. So. No, I probably haven't. I'm going to show Kamba, some kind of combination of chimp and gorilla. Well, that's what it piece. says in Wikipedia, but that's yeah. not actually. What? You can't trust Wikipedia? Yeah, I know. Wikipedia. Shock. Wikipedia celebrates the 450th anniversary of the United States of America. Anyway, um, <laughs> here is the Kula Kamba. Mm. Everybody could see that, maybe. Oh, uh, wait. I got to move it that way, right? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Do you see it? Yeah. Looks kind of humanoid. This is a book. Yeah, really messed up. Um, this book, uh, Explorations. Hmm. 
You see it? Yeah. This guy Du Paul Du Chaillou, and he was a, a French American African African explorer, for lack of a better term. He he was one of the first Europeans to go into gorilla habitat in the Congo area, uh, the Congo River Basin, and describe gorillas for a Western audience in this book. Um, but he also, he didn't discover gorillas. He it was among the earliest descriptions and his descriptions are basically full of shit. They're all about how vicious the gorilla is, how, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it's, you get it. He, he was just, he was, no one's fact checking a guy in the Congo in 1860, you know? Um, yeah. So he, he kind of got away with whatever he felt like saying. So his confrontations with gorilla were hair raising. They would kill people and bend their guns. You know, all of this kind of nonsense that a gorilla would never do being a vegetarian peace loving animal. Another thing that sort of frustrated to shy you and, made him want to make some shit up about his expedition was that he didn't really discover that many species on his own that hadn't already been described. Um, partly just because he wasn't a very observant person. He would say monkeys visited me today. He didn't say what kind. He didn't try to identify them or split them into, you know, groups of any kind. Or, or uh, He wasn't a naturalist. He was an mm -hmm. explorer and a showman. He came back and gave lectures and sold books about his adventures. So that's why he was an adventurer. So anyway, right. he said he had discovered this animal, which I showed you an image of in his book called a Kula Kamba. When you look at the image and you hear his descriptions, you realize he did no such thing. There is no, he didn't discover an animal called a Kula Kamba. There isn't an animal called a Kula Kamba. And his description and the image of it with these big ears and this round head, what he did do is he plugged in a pre-Darwinian concept of the chain of being, which is a, which was used by a lot of racists for centuries, and even Darwin, Darwin's teachings were perverted into a sort of rather than just be a biological teaching, they were perverted into a sort of racist teaching. This I, but this idea of a chain of being where things go from higher to lower, and one of the ways in which you can determine whether an animal is higher or lower is by its cranial capacity, by measuring skulls and determining the amount of brain space per pound of animal or whatever you want to call it. So craniometry is a completely discredited science that was of great interest in the 19th century for obvious imperialistic reasons. Anyhow, Dushayu comes back and he's telling everybody he found this animal that in his description, it wasn't between a gorilla and a chimp. That's a later attempts to justify Dushayu. Dushayu describes it as an animal that's somewhere between a human being and an ape, has a much rounder head, higher intelligence, has these big ears, has this kind of upright posture somewhere in size between a man and a girl, all of this kind of talk. He's filling in a blank spot in his own image of a chain of being. And he's creating an animal that Europeans expected to find. You get what I'm trying to say? Yeah, like so a link. Completely full of shit. And so my idea was to paint the Kula Kamba as if it was real, but he's an actual personification of this discredited science. So he's measuring skulls. He's measuring a gorilla skull, an actual animal. And then the little gorilla has learned from the Kula Kamba to measure the monkey skull and, and buy into this whole theory. And then other skulls are laying around, a full grown gorilla skull, a human skull, another caliper for measurement. So yeah. my idea is like, if you're gonna have a, if you're gonna make up this Kula Kamba, you, it, it, he's sort of, trying to self-justify his own existence. He doesn't exist, but he's working really hard to make himself exist. Right. So he's right. in shadow, so you can't quite make out his face. But I patterned his face after the Kula Kama in this book. And then the reason there's a chimp study below is that I wanted to study the actual way that a chimp 
wrinkles. We base the real wrinkles of a primate as opposed to the sort of corny, uh, bad engraving style of the way the Kulakamba is rendered. I wanted to give you a credible Kulakamba. If Kulakamba was real, what, it, what would it really look like? Yeah. More like it would have the wrinkles that a, a normal primate has or some of the fur patterning and some of the behavioral characteristics. So I tried to make a credible Kulakamba working very hard to make himself exist. <laughs> it's the most meta, talk about totally inside. Exactly, meta science upon There's science. There's no real <laughs> animal in this except right. for the baby gorilla. Yeah, the little guy, that's amazing. Who's, yeah. who's, being, who's being manipulated. Right, docile and very docile. Docile and putting up with being measured and then measuring what the gorilla right. perceives as a lesser being than him. Gorilla let's, see, gorilla do. Let's go ahead and make this chain of being yeah. real. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it has the date 1861, because that's when, when Deshayu said he discovered this Kulakamba. Right, right. Terrific. Well, it's, yeah, it that's is fake, a, dark, that's a darker fake picture. News painting. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> yeah, a fake dark, news painting. Fake news painting. Yeah. But it's blowing up all these received ideas at the same time. I mean, so many of these works do it's, do that. What happens, you said doo doo, but I, the, uh, what happens is I, I, <laughs> I, I don't expect people to know these stories. So yeah. it's important that I make an intriguing image. Right. And if I can do that, and then you see the title Kulakamba, if you felt like it, you could probably research up this stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and that's kind of the, the, that's what you do, but most people don't do. Yeah. But I find it pays off, but it pays off even more hearing you talk about it. Oh, it's fun. Thank you so much for inviting me to this thing. Thank you. I have, there's a great quote in the interview that you and I did in 2017, when you talk about um going back to what i loved when i was a kid and that you know that's and then you, you said i was on the right track it was like this world just suddenly bloomed into this thing that i couldn't have imagined when i was 10 but i would have fucking loved and i think you know <laughs> you're still doing it but the, yeah. but the yeah. there he is the head the head of the cool combo so you do, walton's obsessed by this if you go to the studio there are all these old books everywhere there's books yeah. everywhere you can find but, you know, but at the same time, I think if you were reading the chat, you know, you've also tapped into a real vein of uh, sensitivity and, uh, you know, the idea that we are cognizant, not only are we screwing up the planet for ourselves, but obviously for the species that are sadly along with us, you know, for the ride. Um, and these paintings are deeply, you know, humanist in that sense, um, from the animal perspective, that point of view. And I, I I, I love looking at stuff and it's great to see all this new work, which has a real, you know, sharp focus, I think, in that sense. It's bringing it out. And whether it's because of what we've been going through the last two years or just because you're just a good person, which you are, um, you know, I think it's worth looking into these things at depth, in depth and hearing you talk about them is terrific. So thank you so much, Walton, for being thank so you generous. Thank for inviting me. It's an honor to talk to appreciate it it's like almost 60 people out there listening to this they're out there and in perpetuity on youtube so <laughs> alina um i'm going to turn it over to you eleanor now um to take over and hopefully we'll have some good questions for walton yeah thank you so much walton and jason um, i'll so stop the share oh great thank you um it's been a really amazing um talk so far and i'm excited to get to the questions um, so first, I would like to pass the mic over to GE for our first audience question. GE, you should be able to unmute. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Of course, Jason and, and Walton, thank you so much for this. I've loved this work. It's been activated by it and, and strangely moved by it for so many years now. When I'm looking at the eyes of these creatures, you know, I, I, I feel I get a kind of transmission in the same way that when I read, and I'm driven by literature a lot of times when I look at art. So it's, it's like when I get that kind of transmission, I'm thinking of the same way as when I read the poetry of John Clare, uh, the poet, um, who, who believed that to try to understand uh, the infinite, infinite workings of nature, you had to kind of situate yourself with 
in that world. And you had to do it without a conscious reflection, um, kind of check the ego, leave it behind, leave it in that little box outside the room and, and remain attentive to the material before him. Is this approach in any way near like your practice? Because it sure feels like it. It's exactly right. Um, I try to, I think of it as getting into character. Sometimes people say, don't, uh, do you paint more than one at a time? Incidentally, I don't have any assistance. No one touches these paintings except for me, um, except for like when they go to wrap them up or frame them. Um, but the actual paint is all applied by me. The drawing is all by me. And I do could go into character for this. I take it seriously. It's like a, uh, and, and it does speak to that thing that, um, that, that Robert Thurman said, you know, just that this isn't, this isn't just you, that you have to, you have to honor these animals. They, they need, they need these stories to be told. And, um, and I, I just think it's a good, a good approach to take a humble, humble approach to it if you can, because you do get, uh, I don't know. I've, I've had some bumps in the road and you can, when you're a young artist, you can feel almost sorry for yourself, for your gifts and think that you are so different than everyone else. And I grew up with the punk generation where there was a lot of anger involved in being an artist. Some idea that the world was so completely full of shit and that you had some sort of, uh, you were a middleman between like the truth and the rest of the dumb world that didn't understand. And a lot of, I've had some humil humbling experiences now that I'm 61. Um, not the least of which I'm like a recovered alcoholic. So that had a lot to do with it. And um, you get to this point where you're like uh, less interested in that artistic pose, that, that diva prima donna thing and way more interested in, um, in some sort of humility and, and understanding that, that if you don't, if you, they call it an artistic gift for a reason. And if you can't be, if somebody gives you a gift and you say, oh, that's great. And you throw it in the closet and you don't say anything more about it. It's like, I wear the damn thing every day. It's, I should say, thank you. Like you bought me a nice hat and it's my favorite hat and I'd be bummed out if I lost it and I'd wear it every day, but I never said thank you to you for buying it for me. So I kind of look at it now completely differently than I did when I was say a tortured little 19 year old high school dropout juvenile delinquent artist person who thought the whole world was against him because I hated school. I hated high school and I was being bullied by the football players in my mind, or I was, you know, whatever the fuck I thought was wrong with the world that, you know, I, I wasn't being celebrated for my gifts, you know, enough. And that's how you start out as an artist. And by the end of it, when you've had your ass handed to you a few times, it helps to just be like, I'm in service of this thing. This thing is, is, this thing is, I'm grateful for this thing instead of like, you know, I'm a, I'm a martyr to it, the tortured artist thing, you know? Oh, absolutely. And thank you so much for, for taking us there, man. Yeah, there's a, there's like a, what is it, book Born Under Saturn, I think it's called. Yes, yes. Yeah, study of, of this sort of creation of the troubled artistic temperament as a as a even starting in the renaissance as a even a way to get the pope to shut the fuck up and leave you alone you know um i get it you know it's like yeah i'm all prickly and i'm eccentric and i i don't bathe enough and so stay away you know and that was sort of michelangelo you know he's like as a survival strategy and as a way of not being just the anonymous stone carver that you would have been in the middle ages to make an art star they created this sort of artistic temperament that's super difficult and tortured. But you don't have to buy into it if you don't want to live like that. <laughs> no. And we're so transitional anyway. So yes, absolutely. It's just, yeah, this is the moment. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
Thank you for that question, GE. Um, yes. The next question I will be asking on behalf of um, Principe M. Ruspoli. I'm sorry, I hope you said, I said your name correctly. Um, Principe asks if, um, Walton, you are familiar with the work of the photographer Rosamund Purcell, and also if you know or like the Howard Hawks comedy from 1940 called Bringing Up Baby with Katherine Hepburn and her baby leopard. Of course, I love Bringing Up Baby. I'm super into early Hollywood films and Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn and all of those people. I studied film at Rhode Island School of Design. So I'm, I'm kind of, and I love Howard Hawks and Preston Sturgis and all of those classic comedies. That stuff is amazing, obviously. Um, I don't know uh, Rosamund Purcell off the top of my head. It sounds so familiar. It makes me want to look it up because sometimes I find out that I know the work, but I don't remember the name, which I've had, I've had people do that with me, you know, like, wait, what's your name? And then they, un they, it turns out they've seen the work, you know? Um, so I'm looking it up now, but, uh, I don't have a good answer to that, uh, photography question yet. Um, let me see, American photographer. Oh, cool. Yeah, I I feel like I've seen this sort of a still life thing. I'm not really familiar. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to study up on her and see what's going on with that. Thank you for tipping me off. That often goes in a good place. People recommending that I look at something or asking me if I know something. If I don't, I get to look it up and learn all about it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Principe, uh, there is a PBS special on her. So oh, cool. I can try to link Sweet. to that. That's second. nice. Um, and thank you. And our next question is coming from our very own Raven. Um, Raven, would you like to ask your question and unmute? Hello. Hi. Hi. Okay. So I saw I'm... you earlier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so my question was, um, you definitely spoke a little on your growth and shift as an artist and how you switched techniques in reference to drawing the tiger and even a little bit where you talked about going from like your attitude about towards your art and whatever in high school till now. So in reference to your process and your work, I wanted to know how else you feel like you've changed both in perspective and technique. And are there any aspects from your older works and earlier perspective that you wish you could revisit? Wow, that's that's a really good question. Um, I, I've had, so when I went to Rhode Island School of Design, I had already been painting and drawing most of my life. I was a very precocious kid and I drew animals. I drew animals and natural history subjects when I was young, like starting at five years old and like some and some fairly accomplished drawings by the time I was like nine and 10 of like fur detail on a wolf's head and stuff like that. So I was really keen on that study from a very early. Then I went to Rhode Island School of Design. I was lucky enough to get in and, and they gave me money so I could afford it because I didn't really come from that. And um, I started feeling embarrassed about what I did when I was young. Like this idea that I painted and drew animals seemed very much like what a little kid does, you know? So I wanted to be an artist artist. And, and it was a time where I saw like a racer head, you know? And then I saw, you know, later there was blue, blue velvet, but a racer head particularly. And then um, I, I was seeing all the classic films from that time, Buster Keaton and all that stuff. We used to project, there were a lot of repertory theaters in Providence at that time. And I just wanted to be a filmmaker. I thought that's how I can, how I can really move people that way. So I had contempt for what I was good at, which many young people do. It, they'll say, well, that comes easily. People would say, well, why aren't you in the painting department? Because I already know how to paint. I'm not, they're not going to teach me anything about that. And I just move in, moving on. I want to learn something while I'm here. I'm going to learn how to be a, paint, a, a filmmaker, you know? And so I, I spent a waste, not wasted time, but I learned that I wasn't a very talented filmmaker, particularly, that that wasn't where my, my gifts lie. So, and it, I was working against 
my own nature a lot of the times. And um, when I finally gave into the fact I was a painter, I actually did paint a lot of uh, subjects about, I had a sort of, uh, I had a bit of a wild childhood. I was like a, a little, my brother and I, my dad left when I was 11 and my mom had a high school education, went to work. And so there was, and there were two, there was my older brother and I share in a room and we're in Westchester. It was like an affluent community, but we had no money. So I, we started dealing drugs out of the house because it was the way I could have the bicycles the other kids had. We went from being a sort of upper middle class to being like, uh-oh, you know, like we're eating scrambled eggs for dinner again. And, and so I, I got into some bad crowds where I was like, definitely, and my brother too. He ended up as an art director at High Times, which is funny. But um, so he made a living at it. But we were, we were, we were bad kids. So I, I don't know why I was getting at that. Oh, it was just because it, it got me on a sort of path away from all the cute things I did when I was little. By the time I, I, it took a long time for me to realize that what I was doing when I was 10 years old was kind of exactly where I belonged, you know? And I think a lot of artists can ask themselves that. Like I go to grad students at Yale or something and I say, what did you draw when you were, when you were little, you know? And sometimes they're like, well, I drew like a princess, you know, like, I'm like, maybe you want to revisit that, you know? Um, what was that like for you when you were drawing little princesses, you know, or, or I drew dolphins or I drew, you know what I mean? Or the kid, the boys, some of them, or even the girls, I drew like a, a motorcycle, you know, like with flames coming out the back or something, you know, I, I think it's really important to figure out why, why that was important to you then and what it was about. It doesn't mean that that's what you do. I kind of went right back to what I did when I was little. Um, but in the meantime, oh, the reason I brought up my tortured childhood or my teenage years was I painted about that first. When I got to New York and I started painting full time, I did all these paintings about these sort of hippies there, I, and this kind of crazy trauma that happened as in attendance. And it was just as kind of brutal as the paintings I do now. Like there was a kid who was a friend of my brother's who went in the woods and slid his wrists and then he changed his mind. He was, he was like, he, he'd taken a lot of paranoid. He'd taken a lot of, tried to kick himself in the woods, then came to our, showed up knocking on the door and we rushed him to the hospital. My mom drove him to the hospital. So this kid shows up, this hippie kid with slit wrists. And I painted that. I, 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 I needed to paint that because I saw it when I was like 12. You know, and these were the kind of crazy stories that would happen. Like some kid leaning back and hair sets on fire with the, you know, and he jumps up and his hair's on fire, you know, and I painted a kid with his hair on fire. It was, there seemed like these biblical moments and I painted them in the style of sort of 14th century altarpieces. They were sort of, so I got a lot of that crazy shit out of my system and, and then came right back around to the animals. And I realized I, I, uh, the animals were more convincing than the people I was painting in a weird way. Uh, they were less stylized. They were more direct. Um, I would have my studio was full of all kinds of work. Then I was painting in oils, but I would do these little Audubon, fake Audubons, and then people would walk right over to those. And I noticed that I was like, holy shit, these people are really responding to the fake Audubons I'm sort of doing by my, so I thought, what can I do to push that? It's almost like take what you're really good at and seems to come easily and make it come hard. That seems to be the, the thing that worked for me the best. I could draw and paint animals ever since I was a little kid. And, but I couldn't do 10 foot by five foot watercolor of a giraffe on the deck of a ship until I was 61. You know, it, it, it was a long, it was taking what I, what seemed like an instant gift and turning it into a really difficult project for me even, you know, I'm going up and down a ladder and a scaffold and I'm making this giraffe, it's 10 feet tall. So that was the process really. It was like learning to accept the limits to my gift. Like I'm not also, a, cause I acted also and I was in bands, you know, we, uh, creative people are often kind of good at a lot of things, but 
I found the thing I was really particularly good at and realized if I pushed myself there, I was in better shape, you know? That, that's crazy. Did that, I can relate to that. So yeah, I, cool. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that amazing question, Raven. Thank you, Walter. That was a good one. Sir. Um, Everyone's asking good questions and they're sort of deep, shrinky questions, aren't they? Yeah. Life in Larchmont in the 1970s. I, th I sense a TV show, TV series. And then we moved to Croton, which was like on the Hudson. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it continued wild until I got, weirdly, when I got into RISD, which was supposed to be a crazy school, I got under control more. Like I, work became the drug and the, you know, going to the studio became, at least while I was at RISD, more important. And then actually, then I moved to New York City in the 82 and I lived in Williamsburg and I was one of the first artists that I knew that lived in Williamsburg. Um, and then I guess the bad behavior took off again. <laughs> it was the right place at the right time. There was a hell of a lot going on. You had, you had uh, all of the punk thing happening at the same time the hip hop thing was happening. And it was all, all those guys were still alive, Basquiat and all of that. And all those crazy venues were going strong. So, you know, you could get pretty messed up and then go to area and the DJ was, was, was Basquiat. And, and all the artists are there and at nobody's sober. And it was a pretty quick, I mean, many of us died obviously um, in my generation from that era, but um, I was lucky enough to not die. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously thank God for that. <laughs> the um, animals needed you. They, they, they could have used those other people too, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, thank you, um, Jason. Thank you, Walton. Um, we do have a tradition here at the rail um, of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Liam Brown, to the stage, right, for her reading. Thank you. Liam Brown is the author of many books, including Other Archer and Polyverse, which won the 1996 New American Poetry Competition, selected by Charles Bernstein. In 1989, Brown founded Tender Buttons Press, which is dedicated to publishing experimental women's poetry. She has taught at Brown University and many other universities and held fellowships with the McDowell Colony and many others and from 2017 to 2018 she was the judith e wilson poetry fellow at cambridge university um wow. thank you for being here leanne um so excited to pass the mic over to you cool. thank you can you hear me yes great well said i look forward to seeing your paintings in person they're a good goes in right now yeah over on 24th street 555 24th street yeah, the one over by the river huh I live two blocks away. I'll go right over there. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've just selected, I think, four poems. I was um, want to thank the Brooklyn Rail for weaving poetry and painting together and art and poets together. And um, I love how you can hear about all the research and reading that goes into the backgrounds of the paintings, because that happens with poetry, too. And um, somebody mentioned John Clare, and I was thinking, read The Badger by John Clare, that poem. Oh, yes, please. Badger. It's about a badger being baited by dogs and um, that one especially. And then uh, Marion Moore, the animal, um, pa uh, poems of Marion Moore include things about no swans so fine. And what about a jellyfish? And, um, but they're all sort of like self-portrait poems in a way. So I would recommend those. But um, I'll just read uh, four poems. One's called magenta and it's um, i was thinking about what poems i want to read with a visual art context and i was thinking about you know how joe brainerd and joe joseph cornell would go around and look for a certain color and they did blue usually but i i did magenta because that's my favorite color magenta magnetic in broad strokes my freak out color occurs in nature darker than fuchsia brighter than pokeberry the middle 
abstract energy in Elizabeth Murray's children meeting instances of magenta on rue magenta named after a very bloody battle though blood is not magenta with a sample of dyed silk from the spirit duplicator serendipitous also known as Tyrian purple or mauvine iodine my mind vibrates at a higher register when I see magenta, whether from murex or mix dyed in the wool. C M Y K magenta is the new black. I recommend magenta, a definitive five star color, not much magenta in daily life, a punctuation. Oh, there's a bag in the window, those baseball caps, but they're more hot pink. Magenta's a gentle magnet drawing my eye to a higher place, the top chakra over my skull, not touching, but still part of me, hovering above. Ultra violet manganese is how it all got started. The color change is irreversible. This color purples an unnatural disaster. Two girls wearing magenta, a kind of Magna Carta, walk in together and promptly fall asleep. Could there be magenta leaves? Once you notice it, it's all over. And this one is a list poem I wrote with Sophia Dolan. Thanks for little hearts, everybody. Um, Sophia Dolan is a poet I had on the um, poetry reading on Brooklyn Rail last week. And um, she, was, she runs this great generative poetry workshop. And she brought in um, Kiki Petrosino's poem, Secret Ninja. So she said, what would be your secret profession? So I guess my secret profession is I want to be an artist, but I am an artist, a word artist. But this is a list. I was a secret. I am a secret cartographer. I write subliminal encoded letters with mountains and rivers and elevation marks, all in blue-green, with tiny thin red highlight lines. I am a secret real estate agent. I am assessing how much I can flip your house for when I peer into it on Zoom. I am a secret hairstylist and I invented that salt water spray in a bottle with lots of different kinds of salt that smell like different oceans for that tousled look. I am a secret novelist or might be someday when I figure out how to sit still long enough to write a real book. I'm a, I see the crossover of words in the crosshairs. My eyes drift and I'm a secret victim of convergence insufficiency. Blam! I focus yet again. I'm a secret housewife because that's what I do. I'm a secret astronaut for 11 years. I'm a secret veterinarian, vegetarian, a publisher of my own cat fancy magazine. I'm a secret moth circling the porch light, getting caught in webs. I'm a secret horsefly on a white linen tablecloth. If I were a secret sloth, I would move faster than I do. If I were a moxie soda, I would say drink me. If I were a shift key, I would be broken. But I am not a shift key, not a sloth. I am actually secretly a second grade teacher who sings all day long in a very large Victorian house on one of the coasts surrounded by lupins, but it is impossible to tell which one. I then secretly changed to another secret profession because as a poet, I am retired from any gainful employ. And here's a little poem about Chelsea. The Block. And it's after um, Romare Bearden writing about his block. I mean, making a collage of his block. The block. Still fields old in corners. Overgrown vines up the brownstone back. At a certain slant of sunlight on the last days of Chelsea. Time goes into a zone of still light. Wisteria. The rumble of horse carts. Roses climb the wall. Through the back passageway. Corner cat floral hazel halfway down the block chases sparrows one day i saw her on the pussy willow cart was it colder then in the days of coal shuttle when 10th avenue was called death avenue and the waterfront was only a half a block away and then the last poem i know we're running late but i want to read one more poem this is a list of ways to write a poem so i hope that everybody here will go and maybe jot down one of these ideas and write your own poem today. Write a poem. Write a poem to your clothes. Write a poem or line for each mile post on the Blue Ridge Parkway. 
Think about the people who made your clothes, who made the parkway. Write a poem or ballad for them or both. Poem for the ancestors, either blood or unblood or both. Write letter poems to different ancestors. Put their pictures on your altar or where you can see them every day. Make meals for them of words. Leave flowers and candles of words. Remember that good birthday feeling you got on your solar return when young. Find a way to connect to it and write from it, from the joy of you. Give yourself a gift, a present. Call up people who appear in your dreams, or better yet, write them a dream poem and send it. Make up an unconventional way to spread your poetry around, such as writing or printing it on a colored paper and cutting it into the shape of leaves. Tape the leaves to trees or benches where people will see. Complete this sentence. If I had more time, I would what? Then pick your favorite of these and turn it into a poem. Read your poetry books one line at a time. Use bibliomancy to compose a new poem. Write a book in nine months. Think and feel the transition between the three trimesters. How, to do, how do these terms resonate? Conception, gestation, morning sickness, reorientation, heaviness, slowness, fullness, active labor, birth, Write a longish poem in one month, perhaps your birthday month, a little or a lot each day. Put a notebook somewhere in the house and write it on, write on it every time <clears throat> you pass by. Entitle it with the name of the month or the sign of the lunar month. Meditate upon this phrase. One day I woke up and everything was good again. Hold this thought as Venus moves into the next sign and Mercury moves into Libra, the constellation. Need I say more? The stars are forever things, or we are. They are fixed. They are to be found. Study stars' effects on the psychedelic day, all by itself, full of color, especially orange, the good kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leanne. And thank you once again, of course, to Jason and Walton. And thank you to Robert at Walton Studio and Putrian Paddle at Gagosian for helping make today's event possible. We'd also once again like to thank um, support from Gagosian to make today's conversation possible and encourage everybody to just go see the show. It's really amazing. And we also encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, where we will be uploading today's conversation shortly. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for the, our 80th Radical Poetry Reading, poetry reading curated by Shiv Kotecha, featuring poetry read by Jackie S., Joseph Kaplan, Mamtaza Mary, and Violet Spurlock. Thank you for joining us today, everyone. Um, you can now turn on your microphones to say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eleanor. Thank you, Walton. Welcome. Thank you, Walton. Thank, thank you for you. Thank you, Walton. 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 Thank you, 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 Thank Thank you. Good to see you, Looking forward to see the new issue. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Wharton. You're welcome. Wonderful. Wonderful. Hey, Thank wait, you. Sorry, I was on a meeting, but I, I'm going to check it out and I'm going to see the show now. I'm already right. going to. Oh, good. Something. Oh, you're going to go to the show. Yeah, good. Congratulations, Brilliant. buddy. Thank you so much. That's everyone. Everybody. Yeah, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful paintings. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao.